Welcome to Love Never Fails Television Broadcast, an outreach ministry of the Agape Family Worship Center located at 50 Fairbanks Road, Georgetown, Connecticut, Maine. We pray that the Lord will be exalted in your lives today. The Psalms 92 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work, and I will triumph at the work of your hands. Well, look at your neighbor this morning and say, Today is a joyous day. Amen. Oh, yo, praise the Lord. That was energetic. Wonderful. Oh, so I'm going to have fun this morning then. Today is a joyous day, and this morning, as, as you all know, we're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit, and this morning we're talking about joy. Do you have joy in your life? And uh, as we've been going through our series, you know, we started off in the first week talking about the Spirit of God and how important the Spirit of God is to our walking with the Lord. And then last week we talked about love and how important love is as we, as we look at and talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, but before, you know, we, we, we get too deep into the, to the message this morning, I want to share a joke with you. And that joke is this. A wife texts her husband on a cold winter's morning and she said, the windows are frozen and they won't open. And so the husband texts back and says, gently pour some lukewarm water over it and gently tap the edges with the hammer. About five minutes later, the wife texts back and says, the computer's really messed up now. (laughs) Some of you didn't get that. Windows, computer. There we go. (laughs) Oh, praise the Lord. (laughs) I can tell last week's joke is still setting in for some of you as well about the dyslexic devil worshiper that sold his soul to Santa. That one went right over everybody's head as well. But praise the Lord. After service, someone said to me, I didn't get I didn't get that joke. And so I was like, you didn't? And, I, and so I repeated it for him, and they go, oh, okay, I got you now. I got you now. Praise the Lord. You know, sometimes that's just how these things work. But uh, let's, let's look at the word. And, and this morning, I want us to all read this together. You know, we've been talking about the scripture, Galatians uh, 5:22 and verse 23. And this morning, I want us to read it together because I really believe it's important that we not just hear the word, but we speak the word. And so, uh, even if you have your Bible, just so that we're all in conjunction reading the same words at the same time, uh, read it from the overhead projector with me this morning. So I'm going to count to three, and we'll all read it together. One, two, three. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amen. Amen. You know, this is a powerful passage of Scripture. This really is a powerful passage of Scripture. And there's so much in here this morning. And, and, and that's why we're taking 10 weeks to talk about this, just simply because there's so much. But, but I don't want you to just hear it. I want you to memorize this as we, as we go through this series. And that's why I had you read it with me this morning. I want you to memorize Galatians 22 and 23 as we, as we go through these, these next few weeks. Because it is important that we not just hear the word, but that we also try to remember it. You know, that's, that's really important. And, and uh, you know, I went through a, a phase in my life a few years back where, where I said, you know, uh, I'm not that worried about memorizing Scripture. I just want to read it. Uh, and, and as I read it, you know, it'll be all okay. The Lord will bring it back to me. And, and you know, that's great. God does that. But I do think that, that, that we should also take it on ourselves to try and learn some, to try and commit some Scriptures to memory. And not just the shortest bu- verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. You know, that, that, that's easy. Everybody knows that. Uh, you know, we, we want to learn some more than that. But this morning we're talking about joy. And, you know, I really believe that joy is really one of the most difficult things for Christians to have, yet it's one of the essential factors of being a Christian. And one of the reasons I believe that, that joy is, is so difficult for us as Christians is because I don't think we really understand what joy is. And I think many times, even though we will say joy isn't happiness and we know that, and maybe you don't know that this morning, lots of people don't know that, but, uh, but we have a lot of people that will say, well, joy isn't happiness, it's different from happiness, but we don't know what, what it is if it's not happiness. 
And we don't know how to describe it. We don't know really how to talk about it or, or what to say about it. And we, we don't really know how to define it. And so when things happen in our life, we lack joy because we go, well, I don't really know what joy is. I'm not happy in this moment, you know, the, this just happened in my life and, and I feel sad or I feel, I feel upset or I feel angry or, or whatever the emotion is that goes with it, but, but we're not really sure how to, to say, well, yes, I have joy in this moment. And you know, as I really looked for a definition of, of what joy meant, it really, nothing really grabbed me as to what joy was until I was reading a blog post uh, from the wife of Pastor Rick Warren, his wife Kay Warren, and here's how she defined joy, and I really just love her definition of this, and here's what she says. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. You know, that, that, when, I, when I read that, that just really just grabbed me. And I said, you know, amen. That was all I could say to that. Because, it's, you know, it, I just found that that was such a beautiful way of putting what joy is. And I want to read it again for you because I really want that to sink in this morning. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. You know, joy isn't something that, 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 that should come and go from our lives. Joy should actually be something that's, that's pretty consistent with us. Joy is actually something that, that, just like love, is consistent in our lives. And last week we talked about love, and, and one of the things that, that in ending last week we talked about was that when we have love, joy follows. When you have love, joy follows. And, and even as you read Galatians 5.22, you see where in it, it says that the fruit of the Spirit are love, then joy. And so as we talked about last week, if we don't have love in our lives, then it's pretty hard to have joy. You know, have you ever seen somebody that isn't loving who has joy in their life? I've never seen somebody who isn't loving that has joy in their life. But everyone that I know that is loving is a joyous person. Is a person that, that is, I would say, fits the description that, that, that Kay Warren gave us as to having joy in their life. But I've never seen somebody who is an unloving person, an uncaring person, someone who, who is, as, as we say here in the Caribbean, hateful. I've never seen them be full of joy. And joy is, is, is really an essential part of being a Christian. All of the fruit of the Spirit are essential parts of defining who we are as believers. And as I said last week, I truly believe that love is the prerequisite that gives us sort of the, the launching into all the rest of the fruit. Because, you know, just, just look at it, you know. Have you ever met a loving person who, who didn't have peace or didn't have kindness or patience or goodness or faithfulness? You, you know, it's just, and usually when you meet somebody who's loving, they have joy, they have peace, they have patience, they're kind, you know, all these things. It just seems to flow out of them. But it seems like if you're missing that first one, you're missing them all, doesn't it? And so as we talk about joy, what we're doing is we're not, we're not just doing something completely different from love. Really what we're doing is we're building the joy on top of the love that God has already given us. The love that, that already comes out of us from his Holy Spirit. And so... You know, as I, I just mentioned, you know, talking about memorizing the, the shortest verse in the Bible. You know, a lot of people will think that Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible. And it is one of the shortest verses in the Bible, but it's not the only verse in the Bible. In the English version of the Bible, that is only two words. There's another scripture in the Bible that is only two words. And in the Greek, it's even shorter than Jesus wept. And you know what that scripture is? 1 Thessalonians 5.16. And you know what that says? Rejoice always. That's simply what it says. 
Rejoice always. You know, joy is one of the most important aspects of being a Christian because, you know, without it, really, what do we have? Without joy, you know, what, what, what is our life made of? What, what gets us through the moments of difficulty? What, what allows us to have those moments of, of, of goodness when something good happens in our life? And, and, and it, happiness doesn't take us very far. Because you see what ends up happening is, is that happiness is based on our happenstance, on our circumstance. And the minute our circumstances change, guess what else changes? Our happiness. But the joy should always remain. See, joy isn't just something that we do or something that we try to have. It's a lifestyle. Each and every one of these fruit that we're talking about is a, is a lifestyle. It's something that, that it's a part of who we are, not just something that we do. Because, you know, we have people that can say, oh, well, I did this. Yes, that was a loving act, but, but the rest of the time, you know, somebody says, well, you know, I gave, I gave, I bought groceries for somebody. Oh, that was, that was nice of you. That was so loving of you to do so. But the rest of the time, they're miserable. They, they're shouting at people. They're yelling at people all the time, you know. You, you can't have a pleasant conversation with them. And, and it's like, you know, you did one thing right, and, and what's happening the rest of the time, you know. And so I want to give you a few things this morning about joy, and I've already begun to touch on my first point, and this is, and my first point is this, is that happiness is not a prerequisite for you to have joy. Happiness is not a prerequisite for you to have joy in your life. It's not. You don't have to have happiness and then turn around and say, oh, well, I have joy now. You don't have to do that. You can have joy far long, uh, much longer before you have happiness. And here's the thing, you know, we talk about things like smiling and all that, and, and that's great. But, you know, we have some joyous people that, that don't necessarily smile. And I want to make this clear, that what's on the outside with a smile, for instance, doesn't necessarily reflect what's on the inside. Because we've got a lot of people that walk around and they smile all the time. Smiles every day. Every time you meet them, they're smiling. But, but then you begin to look into their life. You begin to dig a little deeper into the person that they are, into, into their life. And you realize that that wonderful smiling person is really just a mask to hurt and pain and the destruction of what's happening in their life in that moment. And you go, I would have never, ever guessed that you were going through this. You know why? Because we've learned to make counterfeits of the things that God wants for us, the things that God wants to give us. And, you know, we've, it's sad that we have turned these things around. You know, if somebody said to me, I can give you $100 of real money or I can give you a million dollars of counterfeit money, which one would you rather? I would rather the $100, right? Because, yeah, you know, maybe the counterfeit money might fool a few people, but if you ever get caught with it and you go to jail or, or any of those other things, it's, it's not really real money. It's fake. And it looks good on the outside, but, but really when you begin to get into the nitty-gritty of what it is, it, it's lacking. It has no value. So $100 of real money is worth way more than a million dollars in counterfeits. And you see, this is the same thing with joy, is that we can't just say, well, hey, guess what? I'm going to fill my life with this counterfeit joy, and people will never know the difference. But you know what? The joy that's in you is not for other people. It's for you. Now, it may help other people, but, but the, the joy that is in you is given to you for your needs, for your being able to go through circumstances. And that helps and that benefits other people. Don't get me wrong. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. Our strength. 
And so a smile is outward, but joy is inward. And happiness comes from what is happening on the outside. It's coming from, from our circumstances, the things that, that surround us. But joy, joy doesn't start on the outside. It starts on the inside. I want you to look at your neighbor this morning. Give him a pat on the shoulder. Good to see you this morning. I want you to tell him this this morning. And I, I, all right, so, so say this to your neighbor. Joy is an inside job. Now say it one more time with me. We're going to say it all together now. Joy is an inside job. You see, it's important that we understand this. The joy doesn't come from the outside. Joy doesn't come from the things happening around us. Joy doesn't come from our circumstances. It comes from within. Now, remember what we talked about when we talked about the Spirit. We said, where's the Spirit? That the Spirit lives within every believer. And so when we talk about love, well, usually when we're talking about love, we say, I love you with all of my heart. Now, where's your heart on the inside? Your heart isn't outside of your chest. It's on the inside of you. So where does the joy come from? The joy doesn't come from the outside. The, the joy comes from the inside. Where does the peace come from? The peace doesn't come from the outside. The peace comes from within. Because you know what? Everything can be going wrong on the outside, and yet you still have love on the inside. You still have joy on the inside. You still have peace on the inside. And so remember, what we're talking about is not just simply things that we do, but, but characteristics of who we are. Things that make us believers, things that make us Christians, things that make us the servants of God. I like what somebody said. They said, happiness is like a thermometer. It only registers conditions. But joy is like a thermostat. It regulates the conditions. Listen, when you have joy in your life, no matter what's happening on the outside, the joy on the inside will determine how you respond to the circumstances on the outside. You see, the joy allows you to respond differently. But you see, when we're talking about happiness, well, the minute the situation changes and it goes in a direction you don't want it to go, guess what happened? The happiness is gone. You know, uh, uh, and, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, uh, living in today's society, everybody is talking about they want their happily ever after, like a prince or a princess. You know, I, I want to I wanna find my prince charming, and uh, particularly the ladies, and, you know, live in my nice, beautiful castle and have him chase after me and just live this wondrous, glorious life. And 90% of the world is like, God bless your soul. And the rest of us are looking at it and going, you know, there are going to be days where there isn't going to be happiness. There's going to be days where you know, you're going to have difficulties to face. And what's going to happen when you come upon those difficulties? Where are you going to draw from? Because guess what? Life isn't a Disney movie that it's bad right now, but it all gets better in 10 minutes. That's not how it works. As many of us know, there can be times in our lives where we go through difficulties on a daily basis, on a regular basis, for months, for weeks, for sometimes even years. And we go, I'm not happy. But I thank God that God didn't just leave us there and say, well, you're a sad soul now. You're out of luck now. No, no, God said, I'm going to give you something better, something that persists even through the difficult moments. And he said, I'm going to give you joy. Joy is an inside job. What did 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 say? Rejoice always. It didn't say that there would always be a reason to, to be happy. It says to rejoice always, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing. And in James 1, 2, here's what James says. James says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Now, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, we all talk about that sometimes there's things in the Bible we don't like. I don't like the scripture all the time. Being honest with you. There are times in my life where, where I don't feel like being joyous because of what I'm facing, because of what I'm going through. And you know what? There are times where I would rather close the book on the Bible and say, you know, I just, I don't want to hear that right now. 
There were times when I would rather do that, but you know what? When it's on the inside of you, you can't close the book. When it's on the inside, you can't, you can't turn it off. And you see what happens is, is we become so infused with the joy of the Holy Spirit that what happens is, is that no matter what's happening, we still have joy. Even sometimes when we don't feel like having joy. Because let's, let's be honest, there are times where we feel like being sorry for ourselves. There are times where we just feel like being, you know what, I just, I don't feel like dealing with people today. And you know what, I, I just, woe is me. And if you don't like it, get out of my way. And you know what, that works for about five minutes sometimes. And then after that, you know, all of a sudden things just, you just sort of slip back into your, your habit of, of having that joy. Why? Because it's on the inside. It's on the inside. It's not a, a mask that we've put on that has fallen off of our face. It's something that is in us. It's a part of us. As, we, uh, as I gave that definition earlier from, from Kay Warren, you know, she said something interesting in her blog post, and I want to read it for you this morning. She said, you'll find nothing in my definition about joy, about happy feelings, because as we all know, happiness is fleeting and temporary. We tend to think of it that life comes in hills and valleys. But in reality, it's much more like train tracks. Every day of your life, wonderful, good things happen that bring pleasure and contentment to you. At the exact same time, painful things happen to you or to those that you love that disappoint you and hurt you and fill you with sorrow. These two tracks, both joy and sorrow, run parallel to each other every single moment of your life. That's why when you're in the midst of an amazing experience, you have, nagging, you have a nagging realization that it's not perfect. And while you're experiencing something painful, there's the glorious realization that there's still beauty and loveliness to be found because they're inseparable. You know, as, 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 as I read that from her, it just, it really made a lot of sense to me. Because as she said, you know, we tend to think of life in hills and valleys. You know, we're up on the mountaintop, then we're down in the valley. But, but really and truly, this whole concept of, of train tracks really made a lot of sense. Because how can we at one time in our lives say, okay, I'm going through this situation right now, and this is a good situation, or, or this is a difficult situation, and at the same time, when you're going through a difficult situation, you still have joy. Or vice versa, you're going through a good situation, but something else bad is happening. And though you still feel joy on the inside, there's also a little bit of sorrow. And so, you know, that's where I believe we get our term, the bittersweet, from. Because let's face facts, sometimes life is bittersweet. It is. It can be. But our circumstances do not dictate to us whether we are joyful or not. Our circumstances do not dictate to us whether we are joyful or not. Either we are joyful in all things or we're not. We either have joy or we don't. You know, a car is still a car when a car gives trouble. It's just a car giving trouble at that point in time. But it's still a car at the end of the day. There may be a few things that need to be fixed, there may be some issues with it. Maybe the engine is giving trouble. You know, maybe the brake pads may need to be replaced. Maybe something needs to be buffed out because you, you got hit or, or whatever. But it's still a car. We can still be joyful and still have difficulties happening in our life. We may have some things that need fixing, but that doesn't make us any less joyful. The other thing I want to show to you this morning is this, is that the value of our joy is usually only found in our difficult circumstances. The value of our joy is usually only found when we are in difficulty. And you know, it's, it's sort of an oxymoron. You know, the, an oxymoron is two words that don't really seem to go together, but they do. Like light darkness. Things like that. 
And as we read in, in James 1, 2, it says, count it in all joy when you experience various trials. You know, that's, I, I find that statement to be an oxymoron. And I find it to be sort of, it's like, how can you do this? How can you experience difficulties and still have joy? How can you go through difficult times and still have joy? And, and, and yet the true value of our joy is, is really only found when we experience difficulties. Because look at it this way. How many of you in this room right now are sitting here counting how many breaths you take? How many of you are even remotely conscious of the fact that you're breathing? Probably none of us. Yet our body is doing it. But if we were sitting in this room right now and we began to breathe and every breath we take began to hurt us, we would be very conscious of the breath that we're breathing. We would be very conscious of, 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 of what we were doing in that moment. And in that moment, we would begin to value the breath that we have. Because we're now beginning to say, well, what happens when it's gone? You know, joy works sort of very similar to that. In that we don't really pay attention to it when things are going good. But the minute everything goes bad, we go, I need some joy. I need some joy in my life. Well, you see, that's not the time to get it. You see, we should already have the joy within us. Before those circumstances come, before those, those difficulties come. Because joy is able to lead us through our difficult times. In John 16, 20 through 22, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. He says, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain. Because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into this world. Therefore, you too have grief, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. I'm pregnant this morning. You're pregnant this morning, or you should be, with joy. With joy. You see, I, I, you know, ask any mother. Ask any mother. You know, they will remember the pain that they, that they had to go through to push that child out. They had to, they'll remember the, the nine months between conception and all the morning sickness and all the, the pain and all the cramps and everything and, and all the labor pains that they had to go, they remember all of that. But does a mother look at her child every day of her life and go, if you want to know the pain you caused me? <laughs> no, she doesn't. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting to watch when a woman gives birth because a woman gives birth and the child comes out and, I mean, she's just screaming her head off. And she's like, ah! And she's looking at her husband. I hate you. How could you do this to me? And then the baby comes out. And within moments, her complete countenance changes. And she goes, can I hold my baby? Everything changes in that moment. Tears of joy begin to stream down her face. She just, she, she's completely different than she was seconds ago. You see, because though we may go through difficulties, when there is joy inside of us, it doesn't matter what we're facing. It doesn't matter what we're going through. When we come out on the other side of it, all we can do is rejoice. All we can do is have joy. All we can do is be filled with joy in that moment. Just as a, as a mother is filled with joy at the sight of her child, so are we filled with joy at the sight of the Spirit of God. At the sight of the working of God. At the sight of knowing that God is with us in the midst of our circumstances. You see, the Bible tells us that God will never leave us and he will never forsake us. 
and I thank God. And that in and of itself should bring us joy. You know, the word joy that is used here in Galatians 22 is a very, has a very interesting definition behind it. And the definition is given of the word joy in Galatians 22 is joy that overflows because of faith in the gospel. Joy that overflows because of faith in the gospel. Here's what it's saying. If you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you should have joy. Because of your belief in God, because God has saved you and set you free, and because you believe what the word of God says, that is the joy or that is the source of your joy. That it doesn't matter what you're going through because even though you face difficulties, you go, but I have a promise in the word of God. But I have life because of what Jesus did for me. But I am saved and sanctified and set free because of what God did for me on the cross. That I have the good news. And the good news, oh, check this out. We rejoice at good news. We are filled with joy at good news. And the gospel is called the good news. And so just at the sight, just at the sound of the gospel, we should be filled with joy. And what God is saying is, I've given you something to sustain you. But God didn't just give us a book to sustain us. God said his son, first of all. Then God said his spirit. And so the joy is already in us. And we should have that joy because of what God is doing. You see, the value of our joy is found in difficulty because, you know what, if a mother never went through what she went through to push that baby out, guess what? She wouldn't have that joy. She wouldn't have that joy. She wouldn't be filled with that joy. You see, sometimes we have to go through difficulties to find the value of the joy that is in us. You see, joy is God's will for your life. Joy is God's will for you. You know, as a pastor, I think one of the most common questions I get is, or, or one of the most common statements I hear is, Pastor, I just want to know what God's will is for me. You know, I, I hear that on such a regular basis. I just want to know what God's will is for my life. Or I just want to be obedient to God's will for me. Pastor, I just want to follow the Lord and just, just follow his, his will for my life. But, you know, I, I don't know what God's will is right now. And, you know, I, I hear that so often. And I oftentimes point people in this direction. Read 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Read 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And it's such a beautiful passage of Scripture because, you know, we overcomplicate what God's will for our life is sometimes. Sometimes, you know, we, we want to talk about, oh, yes, God wants to lead us this direction. God wants to do this. God wants to do that. And, you know, I want to know what God's will is here, 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 and there. But you know what the Word tells us? In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, rejoice always, first of all. Second of all, pray without ceasing. And third of all, in everything, give thanks. And then I love what it says. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see, we want to know what God's will is in all these areas of our life. But I want to tell you this morning, if you rejoice always, if you give thanks in everything, and you pray without ceasing, I promise you, you'll follow the will of God for your life. That much, I can guarantee you. That much I can guarantee you. These three things, as simple as they are, as easy as they seem to be, we struggle with them. And we want to know what God's will is for our life. And, and you know, we have a lot of people that, and, and don't get me wrong, that when I say a lot, I mean a lot. We have a lot of people that the minute things go wrong in their life, what they begin to say is, God, why have you forsaken me? When God's promise to us was never happiness. God's promise to us was never that everything would be golden and good every day of our life. God promised us that there would be trials. 
God promised us that there would be tribulations. God told us that from the very beginning. But he said to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I will give you joy to sustain you. He said, I will take your sorrow and turn it into dancing. I will take your mourning and turn it into joy. God says, listen, you are going to face difficulties. And you know what? We would call God a liar if he told us any different. Because if God told us, hey, just become a Christian and don't worry, your life will be all better, we wouldn't have very many Christians. Because the word doesn't tell us that everything is going to be okay. And you know, it's, it's funny, you know, that, that from a marketing standpoint, that's a bad way to market your material. You know, hey, just buy this vacuum. And in three months' time, don't you worry, it's going to break up and fall apart and you're going to have to replace all these parts in it. But it's a great vacuum. How many of you would buy that vacuum? I wouldn't. And yet, Jesus tells us, he says, listen, this road is not for the faint of heart. He says, this road is difficult. He says, you will face trials, you will face tribulations. But he says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Those were his words to us. You see, God gave us a tool to overcome any circumstances that we came across. God gave us the tool to, to, re, to be able to have something worthwhile to hold on to in the middle of everything going wrong. And that was joy. That was joy. And you know, it's sometimes difficult for us to feel like holding on to joy. But I thank God that first of all, it's not my joy that sustains me. It's his. It's not my joy that sustains me. It's, it's his. It's his joy. Joy is God's will for you, yes. But as we're going to talk about peace next week, joy leads us to peace. Just as the love leads us to joy, joy leads us to peace. You see, if you don't have joy in your life, don't count on there being peace. If you don't have joy in your life, you can't have peace and not have joy. You have to have joy if you want to have peace in your life. In Psalms 4, 6 through 8, it says, Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. You know, that's just, I read that and, and it just, it really just touched me on the inside. It really just softened my heart. Because as I read it, I realized that we seek after many things. We go after all sorts of things but, that will make us happy. But how many times do we go after things that will fill us with joy? And you know, I, I find it very interesting that wine in the Bible oftentimes refers to, to joy. Now, wine is wine, don't get me wrong. But many times in the Bible, when the Bible begins to talk about there being wine, it's talking about joy coming. It's talking about there being joy in our lives. It's talking about there being this transition from having joy to having peace. Because you see, if you have joy, I promise you, peace will come. Peace will come. But when was the last time you experienced that? When was the last time you experienced peace? The peace that surpasses all understanding. 
As a matter of fact, the better question is this. When was the last time your heart abounded with joy? When was the last time your heart abounded with joy? When was, when was the last time you didn't have trouble sleeping? When was the last time that you felt safe? When was the last time that, that you just felt like you could just rest? That you were safe and secure? You see, if we are lacking joy, we will never feel those feelings. If we're lacking joy because, because of what is happening around us, we will never be able to experience those feelings of peace. Experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding within us. And unless we realize that joy is the source of peace and love is the source of joy, then what happens? What happens? And more so than that, that the spirit of the Lord is the source of all of them. You know, I was, I, I, I was toying with this idea this week in my mind and really trying to, to pray and see if it made any sense. And I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to say it, but I'm, I'm going to say it now. You know, the Bible talks about this being the fruit of the Spirit. But as I just thought about a tree, you know, a tree is made up of many parts. And, you know, we have the trunk, we have the roots, we have the branches, the leaves, all the stuff, Right? And I don't know, but I was, just, I was just thinking about it and, and how we've been going about this message. And I know that the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and on and on. But as I really just sort of examined what I've been discovering about the fruit, I looked at it as a tree and I said, you know, really and truly, the Spirit of God is like the soil. The Spirit of God is like the soil. Because if you don't have soil, you can't have a tree. And if you don't have a place where nutrients and life can come from for the tree, the tree dies. And the Spirit of God is like the soil. But, but then I began to really think about it some more and I said, so then what is the root? What is the, is the thing that, that helps us to absorb life from the Spirit of God? And it hit me and I said, it's love. We can't, we can't have a tree, we can't have fruit if, 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 if the life, first of all, isn't being sucked up. What, what, what's sucking up the life? The roots. And again, you know, for all of us literal people out there, yes, I know it says the fruit of the Spirit. But that's all right. I'm going to change it right now and call it the tree of the Spirit. Temporarily. And I just started to, to really think about this and I said, you know, if the Spirit isn't there and we are not able to absorb what the Spirit, the life that the Spirit is giving to us, and the life that the Spirit of God is giving to us is love, then how will we ever experience the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the gentleness and the faithfulness and, and all these things? In 2 Corinthians 7, 4, it says, I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in our affliction. You know, Paul is one of the, I, I really believe Paul is one of the most interesting Bible characters ever. Oh, people in the Bible, I don't like calling them Bible characters, it makes them sound like they're not real. He's one of the most interesting people in the Bible. You know, Paul was beaten so many times, whipped, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked. I mean, you name it, Paul went through it. Paul either A, had a wife that left him, or B, had a wife that died on him. And we know that because Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin, and, and he never makes mention of his wife, but you have to be married in order to be a part of the Sanhedrin. And so at one point, Paul had a woman in his life, and he makes no mention of her. So, and there's a lot of evidence that goes behind him leaving her, but, but, but Paul went through a whole bunch of stuff in his life. As we, as we put it in today's term, you could, t you could say Paul went through hell on earth. Paul experienced things that, that many people in this world will never experience or have never experienced. And yet, Paul is the one talking about having joy in all things. 
Paul is the one talking about rejoicing always. Paul is the one telling us that, that he's filled with comfort and overflowing with joy in his affliction. You know, I, I just look at Paul and I say, you got to be made out of some special stuff to go through what you've gone through and to have the attitude that you have. And then I remember the words of Paul. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ who lives through me. And it just made so much sense to me. Paul realized that these things he will have to face in this world. But Paul had peace because of his reliance on God and realizing that the joy of the Lord was his strength. Not that his joy was his strength, but that God's joy was his strength. You see, if we don't, if we don't realize that this is not our joy to have, then we are going to be looking for joy in all the wrong places. You see, it's not our joy. It's God's joy. It's his gift to us to say, here you go. Here's some joy. And we don't have to wait for God to bring it as long as we're believers. I'm here to tell you today, that joy is already in you because the spirit of God is living in you. And so you don't have to go looking for that joy. You don't have to go looking for the love of God. The love of God is in you. You don't have to go looking for the peace of God. The peace of God is in you. You don't have to go looking for the patience of God. It's already in you. The question is, have you lined yourself up? Have you aligned yourself with his word? My last point to you this morning is this, is that if you want to find joy, you'll find it in the presence of God. You'll find joy in the presence of God. In Psalms 21, 5 through 7, it says, Through the victories you gave us, his glory is great. You have bestowed on him splendor and majesty. Surely you have granted him unending blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. Through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. You cannot be shaken when you are in the presence of God. But the problem I find with too many of us as Christians, and I myself am guilty of this, is that we don't spend enough time in the presence of God. We want to walk in and walk out. We want to we want to we want to do our our, our 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 what we call our due diligence to to come and spend a, a few minutes, a few hours maybe in the presence of God, but but, but we don't want to sit and soak in it. As Jesus talks about, abide in me and I will abide in you. We don't want to, we don't, we don't understand the concept of abiding. We just, we just want to come and go. How do I know that? Because we come and we say, all right, now I got to go and get into the presence of the Lord. Rather than saying, I'm going to get into the presence of the Lord that I've been in all week. That I've been in it all day. I'm just going to join some other people in the presence of the Lord. I've been there and I'm just waiting on you all to join me. You know, it's not, the presence of God is not something we just simply walk in and walk out of. That's, that was never God's intent. You see, if God's spirit is within us, and here's the thing. His spirit is within us, so his presence is with us. But we ignore what is on the inside because of what is happening on the outside. And because of what is happening on the outside, we can't look inside and see that within us is the joy of the Lord, is the peace of God, is, is all these things that we're looking for. It's there. 
It's there already. But because of what's happening on the outside, the circumstances on the outside, we begin to go, oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Where is the joy? Where is the peace? Joy can overflow in our lives. We can have that cup that runs over. We can, we can be filled with joy unspeakable. And it's not that it's already there. You know, if you, if you said to me, I'm thirsty, and I got you a cup of water, and I put the cup on the table, and you never pick up the cup to drink from it, are you ever going to satisfy that thirst? No. You're going to stand there, and you're going to continue to be thirsty. You can have it at your disposal, but if you never ever use what is there, you'll never tap into it. You know, you remember, I remember growing up, you know, the, the song, J-O-Y, joy, joy in the Holy Ghost, J-O-Y, joy, joy in the Lord, don't let the devil steal your joy. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Hey, whatever happened to us? And I remember singing that song as a kid and just, just doing stupid stuff, just being crazy and just, just enjoying it. You know, I really believe that if we had joy in our lives, we would learn to enjoy life some more. Seriously, as Christians, you know, I, I just, I really believe that one of the, the, or if we look at what that antithesis of joy is, if we look at the opposite of joy, what is it? It's misery. It's complaining. It's all these things that, that first of all, we don't like in other people, so why do we do it? But yet joy is, is, is being overwhelmed with gladness, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And you know, sometimes we let the devil come in and steal what God has for us. You know, it's like, it's like this Sunday morning in a small town, the devil shows up at this church and sits right on the front row. And everybody in the church begins kicking and screaming and, oh, Lord, it's the devil. And they run out of the church. And this one gentleman is sitting down at the front of the church and he didn't move and he didn't really seem to be bothered by him, the fact that he was there. And the devil was a, a little confused. And so the devil walks over to him and says, everybody else ran out of the church. Why are you sitting here? He says, aren't you bothered by me? He says, nope, sure not. He says, well, why aren't you afraid of me? The man says, I've been married to your sister for 25 years. <laughs> he wasn't letting him get the better of him. He wasn't letting him take his joy away. He came to church to praise the Lord and come hell or high water, he was there. He wasn't letting them take anything away from him. But what about all those people that ran out those doors? They were bothered by the circumstance. Listen, we don't have to let the circumstances rattle us. We don't have to let the circumstances shake us. We don't have to let the circumstances drag us down. Because as Psalms 21 says, it's through the victories that God has given us, that he has bestowed upon us his splendor and his majesty, and that it is through that that he has granted us the unending blessings of God that have made us glad that we can rejoice in God's presence. But you see, we got to be able to tap in. we got to be able to reach in and say, Lord, I need some more. God, I don't know, this, this is happening. God, give me some more joy. God, it, my, my reservoir is leaking. Give me some more. 
But if we don't reach in, if we don't press into the presence of God, we're going to miss it. You know, last week the the Lord gave me a a word. And it, it really just hit me really hard. It really did, and, and I struggled with it, and I don't know why. And the words were simply this, press in. Press in. Press in, and you will be filled. You know, as I just, and I, and I don't know what, what, what was in me that was struggling with that, but as I just, as I felt just the Lord just saying that to me, I just, I struggled. And I said, God, why in this moment am I hesitating? Why am I hesitating? You're telling me that if I press in, I will get what I need. I will get the love. I'll get the joy. I'll get the peace. But if we don't press into the presence of God, we will never, ever get what God intended for us to get. Because it is in his presence that there is fullness of joy. In his presence alone. And so if you want to know what my encouragement to you today is this. Press in. Press in. Press into his presence. Press into his presence. And and you know what? You you may be saying to me right now, Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with this right now and I don't really know what to do. You know, in Nehemiah, we see where the people of Israel went into slavery in Babylon. And they come back. And all of a sudden, they see the wreckage of what is happening around them right now. They see the wreckage of their home. They they see the wreckage of, of all that they hold close and dear to them. And they're looking at it and they're saying, what are we going to do now? And this was a difficult time for them. And Nehemiah helped them to, to rebuild the walls. And, and, and the entire nation was really sort of involved in this process of rebuilding the walls, those who had went back. And after they rebuilt the walls, it was interesting. The people were still grieved. The people were still grieved. And, and in Nehemiah, it tells us, it says, where Nehemiah says, don't be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, we remember that first part, you know. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We forget the first part that says, don't be grieved. They just rebuilt their city and yet they were grieving. But Nehemiah looks at them and says, your focus is in the wrong direction. He says, you need to look upwards not outward. You need to look towards God. He says, his joy will be your strength, but you have to look to him. But you know what that also says to me? That the reason why some of us don't have joy in our life is because we need to rebuild some things that have been broken. We need to rebuild some things that have been broken. We need to let go of some things that were great in the past but aren't so great anymore. And we need to move on beyond them. Because for some of us, what's hindering us from having joy is not that the joy is not there. It's that we are too busy looking behind us to experience what God has for us. And this morning, God wants to fill us with his joy. But the question I have for you this morning in ending is this. Are you depending on God's joy or your joy? Because if it's yours, be prepared to be disappointed. But if it's his, be prepared for some strength. Be prepared to soar on the wings of eagles. Be prepared to move into the things that he has for you. Be prepared to, to, oh, hallelujah, to just move in, in, in ways that you never imagined, in places that God will take you. 
Thank you for watching our television program, and we pray that you've been blessed by today's message. I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, and I'd like to take this opportunity to pray with you today and ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, I want you to pray with me this prayer and accept Him into your heart today. And you too can be a child of God. Let's pray this prayer. God, I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for all the wrong that I've done. And I ask you to come into my life today. Cleanse me and make me whole. I'm sorry and I ask you to lead me down the path of righteousness for your name's sake. I want to be your child and I want to do your will. Have your way in me today, Lord, and I will forevermore live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's all you had to do, folks. It's as simple as that. And so if you pray that prayer today, you're a child of God. And so I want to get you plugged into a church. Get plugged into a body, a fellowship of Christ somewhere. And get deeper into your relationship with God. Because there's no greater relationship than a relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you and have a wonderful day with Jesus.